I also give a warm welcome to Honorable Dr. Langolo Mumba, our Vice President of Namibia. Um, the role of the Namibia Scientific Society changed quite a bit, with today's slogan being Science for Society. For that, we have five pillars that we built on. One being evening lectures for the public at our premises opposite the National Theatre of Namibia. We are assigned mining to marine mammals, where we always strive for a balanced, unbiased presentation. In more normal years than this one, we typically host about 60 of such evenings a year. The second pillar being excursions to point of interest in Namibia, the latest one led along the skeleton coast guided by geologists and marine archaeologists. Thirdly, we publish um, a close to yearly scientific journal, which this year will have its 67th institution. Fourthly, we host a collection and further ethnic collections. Last but opposite of least, we run Kosi Publishers, which produces books on Namibian topics, be it reptiles of Namibia, books about the history of this country, like for example, Children in Exile, or Are You a Person or a Ghost? by Dr. Nikondo, is here with us as well tonight. Let me go to my statement. It is a statement which is going to be taught in pictures. The first one is the genesis and the process of writing the book. I will introduce you to my parents and to my siblings, to my family. Then I will navigate the journey in exile. And after we return back to Namibia in my life in the public service, the sporting activities, the farming activities, and again the return to the public service. Can I have the next? Okay. The idea of writing of writing a book has been with me for some time and it has been really supported by my wife. I must say that in exile I attempted to write poems and I did, I think about two of them. <laughs> but during that time we had no computers, we had no iPhones, we did not have laptops. It was all handwritten and it was not saved anyway. <laughs> so that one is lost and I'm trying to remember, but with difficulties. But let me take you to, to the book that I started some years after independence. And uh, when I returned from the studies at Harvard uh, University of Public Health, in the USA. That is actually where I was introduced to a computer. And I remember one of our classmates when we were doing elementary and we were shown how to use the mouse. So one lady from Kenya, she was screaming. We say, what's happening? We say, no. I lost my mouth, my mouse. <laughs> but then I continue when I was at the University of London. Uh, you are required to write a thesis as part of your the fulfillment for your degree. But then those who did not know how to operate a computer have to hire somebody to write for them, and they pay. But with me, I didn't have that money to pay somebody else. 
So day and night I was learning how to manure, how to manipulate a vector. And um, that is now how I wrote myself my thesis. Um, back home, I was then appointed as a permanent secretary in the Ministry of Health and Social Services. And we all know, even with those who have not experienced it, the job of a permanent secretary is arduous. You hardly find time for anything else. So when I start writing the book, I would sit, if I travel from Venlo to Frankfurt, uh, I would jot a few lines. And actually, when you are waiting for your next flight, you jot some lines. When you are on board, you do the same. So that is how I found time to put some words together for the books. The daughter of, of Vilho, and this is the son of uh, Esther Washanta. Okay, you may go back to me. Thank you very much. So next time you know them, and if at one time you find them doing something not good, please you can report it to me. <laughs> uh, Beth, um, uh, list is please. Thank you very much. So we're hoping that when you connect with the people, you'll also pay to buy this book. So I'm going to read from two different chapters to just give you a taste of his writing style, what he talks about when he mentions his life. And um, after that, I'll hand over to Dr. Nikondo. Right. So the first part I'm going to start reading about is in part two on page 48 of the book, The Interrogations. I want to start from the beginning, just somewhere in the middle. So this talks about a part of his life when my father and the three traveling companions that he left Namibia with through Angola were caught and in jail in Angola. So he states, with time, more and more police officers were committed to the bigger group. On a crucial day, there were no police officers available to take me to town to buy my cigarettes, so I suggested to the officer in charge that I could go alone while my travel companions would remain at the police headquarters. It took 30 minutes, and I subsequently kept repeating this request, going alone to buy my cigarettes, staying a little longer each time. In the meantime, because of our good behavior, the army personnel that were deployed in our cells were withdrawn, and the other layers of security, however, who were monitoring us remained. So we were effectively left alone in our cell, free to plot our next move, while we continued to sing and play cards to kill the time. Now, the last day that I went to buy cigarettes, I made arrangements with a taxi driver to meet us at a pre-arranged place, at a pre-arranged time, and that is when we decided we were going to escape from our cell. Whether they managed that or not, you'll have to buy the book to find out, <laughs> but it left on a cliffhanger. Oh, everyone here is vulnerable. So, my uh, speech actually, uh, Dr. Shangula uh, came to me and said, 
I want you to come and speak, but I will give you a special part that you're going to speak on, and that's military. So, uh, you know, because in, uh, during the struggle, military was one of the important parts, uh, because by that time, if you were not trained, no one, you know, respected you. Respect you. So that's why we see many people were fighting to go to Tabasa and Yoko for training. So that's also the reason that why I'm dressing in the military attire, uh, in my uniform. Uh, maybe some people who do not know this, uh, you know, what type of uniform is this one? Yeah, but this one is not for the struggle. This one is uh, for the Namibian Defense Force. When I retired, uh, in 2003, and I'm still there as a reservist. I used to receive this one, and you see, I'm a major. So I still, I still have that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that my part is on the military side. As I said earlier, that during the struggle, that was the important part of it. Uh, If now we talk about Dr. Shangura as a military man, let me first talk about military life. Uh, because when you talk of military, no one, no one uh, not everybody that understands what we mean by military life. So I have got some simple points there. I'm not really going to dwell much on each and every point. What we mean is like, Military life is another life that's opposed to another one which we call civilian life. If you are trained militarily, then you come into another part of life which is military. Uh, and in the military, there's a lot of nuts and bolts. And uh, you know, here I also say that a little bit of things that make up an ordinary day in the, uh, the military life are totally foreign when it comes to another life, it is a civilian life. There are so many things there that really you can't understand if you have not you have there. Military has its own legal, legal means language, jargons. Uh, uh, um, we also have other structures, uh, social structures, traditions, cultures, and expect, expectation, expectations. You know, if we talk of some legos, in military, if for example I'm saying I'm going to do chicken parade, meaning that I'm going to pick papers, that's the jago. And you now there are so many ways, even the way you talk, the way you eat, you have to be trained in military, all those types of things, the way you dress and even the way you, uh, you socialize. Uh, when it comes even for war, I remember that time, you know, when the South Africans, for example, capture our soldier. You know, sometimes they suspect whether you are really a soldier or not. They simply say war. You, you know, in military, we start with the left foot. We don't start with the right foot. Automatically, if they say war, even if you are among the civilian, they say, okay, come in, come in, come in. They already know that this one is a military man because the step that you start with is the one that they know. That's why I'm saying even when you walk, when you dress, even when you socialize. If I'm dressing like in uniform like this, I can't socialize, I can't touch uh, someone in a uniform. Or if um, uh, a brigadier day he comes here, then I have to stand and salute that person. Those are type of military ways. Oh, giving the way this, that one is just for the military ways. Yeah, let's now talk of military when uh, Dr. Shangra went for, 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 for training. Trained military. Usually we just see him. Oh, sorry. Okay, he was a trained military. Now we only see him as he was uh, portraying that he's the, you know, 
talking about COVID-19, they thought, some people thought it's just a mere symbiote, but that one is a military man. So, um, he receives military training at the military academy in uh, Simferopol, in the former Soviet Union. You know, if you talk of that, maybe I just go quickly to the map. You see where he was trained? For those who are interested in geopolitics and geomilitary, then you know this is this is the Crimea. You know now there's a problem here uh, because of Ukraine and you know Russia. So then he was trained here militarily. That's why he received his military training in Russia. So this is part of Russia. Only the sea here, and you see the Moscow's and everything that he was mentioning there just somewhere apart. This is where he was trained. So, uh, you know, that one is one of the largest or second largest city in the Crimea Peninsula, where he was trained militarily. Uh, general training, then, if I continue with that one. So, military training is not. Here I just want to explain this, uh, something small. Because some people, if they hear someone is trained militarily, they thought it's just something to do with firing a gun. That it goes beyond that. What we are saying here is that, uh, you see, in the military, you learn all this. Effective leadership, competencies, you must have them, basic soldier, uh, We are here today to witness the launching of a book about courage and determination by one of such veterans of our national liberation. I just commend Dr. Shangura for the clarity and the excellent arrangement and organization of ideas and the thoughts throughout this book, which will be launched soon. He did the chapters and the sections of the book are organized in a logical manner that makes the book easy to read and to understand the plot and the storylines. From the day of his departure from Namibia together with his comrades to his experiences in exile over many years, Dr. Shangura draws the reader into the experiences and bring to life the events that happened at the various stages of his life. Immediately after independence, he continued to serve the Namibia people in many capacities after the attainment of our freedom and the genuine independence on the 21st March 1999. the Republic of Namibia. And we have we have sat so quite a long time and now we have come to the end of this event. This event is very special for me, my brothers and sisters, because in the first place I never in my wildest dreams Felt that the Kabumbi would one day write a book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, he, has, he has got not many words in the first place. Because I thought people who are talkative, they are the ones who should write books. <laughs> but he is such a, a soft spoken person and a man with very few words. And on that basis, I always, oh, I, I wrote him off, you know, that oh, maybe one day he won't be able to write 
is only 120 pages. <laughs> Thank you.